So um, we have two speakers and um, first we'll have Dr. Sherry Madigan and then we'll have um, Jordan Cabell to, to talk about her experience. So Dr. Sherry Madigan will start with a presentation. She's a clinical psychologist and associate professor and Canada Research Chair in Determinants of Child Development in the Department of Psychology at the University of Calgary and the Alberta Children's Hospital um, Research Institute. And she has done a, just an amazing program of research on social, how social experiences um, help or hinder children's learning, behavior and development and mental health. Um, and she's published you know, hundreds of articles in major journals and also had her work featured in, you know, in a lot of media. Um, she and I were, I was lucky to do um, a panel with her during, I guess I can't remember, I guess it was in the spring. Um, and I was just really impressed with her ability to make her research accessible um, to a wide range of audiences. So welcome Sherry and thank you for doing, for doing this. And I hope the volume is good um, now. If, people, if it's not, let us know. Thank you. Go ahead, Sherry. It's good on my end. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with Jordan and to be able to do this together and uh, be able to have an opportunity to talk to everyone about um, child and youth mental health during COVID. And I, I think this is on the minds of many, many people. So um, I'm really thankful to Dr. Conan for actually you know, prioritizing this as, as a important topic today. So thank you so much. So I'm going to just chat about the impact of COVID-19, obviously, um, and just a quick note that I have no disclosures to report. The objectives for me over the next 25 minutes or so is really to try to contextualize what's going on for youth during COVID in terms of their mental health. And um, we've done that globally. We've done a big study where we've looked um, how kids are doing globally, but also um, how we're, they're doing in Alberta in particular in a study where we've been following families for 12 years prior to the pandemic and then able to see how, how kids and parents are doing during the pandemic. I'd like to talk about some of the most salient stressors that I think are happening for both parents and children during COVID. And as much as possible, I've tried to implement some strategies um, to really try to foster as many coping strategies and skills for youth and families as, as possible. So for those of you, um, Many of you are probably really familiar with these terms, but I just thought I'd put them up here. So when I talk about mental health difficulties, um, I particularly in my research and my clinical work focus on um, depression and anxiety. So when kids are experiencing these, either depression and anxiety, which are the most common, um, you know, mental distress symptoms amongst, amongst youth, they're feeling sad, their mood is, is, is not what it used to be. Sometimes they feel a sense of hopelessness, they're really not feeling motivated, they're lacking interest in things. Um, and oftentimes there's physical symptoms that accompany that. So their sleep has, habits have changed. They're either sleeping all the time or not sleeping enough. Um, they're having a hard time concentrating when they're in the classroom or when they're at home. And sometimes their appetite changes. So they either eat more or they eat less. Um, these are, when, when there's a collection of these over time, these are all symptoms, but when there's a lot of these, and or the adolescent or the child is feeling a lot of these, we often say that, that they might have, have a, a depressive disorder. Anxiety is more when there's lots of worry, um, hyper arousal. So they're um, feeling like, you know, uh, they're really hyper vigilant of the environment and what's going on. Um, and sometimes there's debilitating fear. So they're really just having a really hard time getting out of the house, getting to school because they're afraid of what might meet them at school. And in the case of COVID, um, you know, that's a legitimate fear because it could be that when they're in group settings, their, their chances of getting COVID increase. So what are the things that we did to really try to get a sense of what's going on globally in terms of child and youth mental health is something called a meta-analysis. So what a meta-analysis does is it takes all the studies that have been done over the course of the pandemic on child and youth mental health, where they've given us data that says we looked at 200 um, kids and 20% of them were had depression or 20% of them have anxiety. That might be in one study. In another study located in Australia, they might have said we had 3,000 kids, we studied 3,000 kids and 55% of them had depression. So one of the things a meta-analysis does is it kind of funnels it all into one space so that we can say, 
you know, across all of these studies where there was a range of different um, percentages of mental health distress, what is the prevalence amongst all these studies worldwide? So we were able to do that across 29 studies that have been published so far. It includes 80,000 youth from across the world. And you can see just these flags here um, where some of the studies emerged from. So North America, South America, Europe, um, in the Middle East, and as well from um, some, uh, as well from Ch as well as from China. So we we pulled all that to really get a clearer sense and to, to try to derive a little bit more precision around what's going on for youth. And we want that precision because when one study finds that 20% and another study finds 55%, it's really sometimes hard to. Um, make policy decisions based on that because it's so wide ranging. So what a meta-analysis does is helps us get some more precision in what's, what's likely going on for most youth around the world. So what we found across all these studies is that about one in four youth are telling us they're, they're actually experiencing clinically elevated depression. And clinically elevated means that they reach a cutoff point where their symptoms are moderate to severe enough that it impacts their daily functioning. Um, and what we found is that one in five youth are experiencing anxiety. And to put this into context, before pre-pandemic, when we looked at you know, global estimates of clinically significant or clinically elevated depression and anxiety in youth, we found it was more like one in 10. So about 10% of youth were experiencing depression or anxiety. And what, so what we're seeing essentially is a doubling of mental health distress during the pandemic. So the pandemic is certainly taking a toll on many youth. We were able to run some statistics to figure out who might be struggling a little bit more or a little bit less than others. And what we found is that girls are, are struggling with their anxiety and their depression a little bit more than boys, and that older teens are tending to struggle with their depression and anxiety more so than younger teens. And you know, this is what you would actually expect in non-pandemic times. This is pretty consistent with the literature generally that girls and older teens are more affected by depression and anxiety. But I think that what we found that was quite unique to the to I think experiences during the pandemic is that many people thought, well, you know, teens are going to rebound, they're going to get better, like, you know, they're really resilient, kids are really resilient, which is really true. Um, but they actually haven't been rebounding in the way that we thought they would, they would be. And what we found is that as the pandemic ticked on, as the study that was done later in the pandemic, we actually found that kids were, were doing worse. So kids aren't getting better over the course of the pandemic in terms of their mental health. They're actually, their mental health is struggling more and more. So I think that's something that we really have to think about um, because it means that they need services and we're gonna see an influx in more and more needs in the emergency department, um, in your primary care practice, if you're in one, if you're a psychologist in your practice, your know, kids are, are gonna need a, a services. So we have to really pay attention to this. Um, so rates of, uh, of sorry, child depression and anxiety have doubled. Um, will these be sustained? I think that's something we really have to think about is, um, and that's why these longitudinal studies where we follow youth over time, we can look at whether this actually is sustained once kids go back to school or once kids are able to, you know, uh, resume some of the functioning that they had pre-pandemic, are they gonna get better? So that's why we need some of these longitudinal studies to keep following youth over time. So this is an extremely busy graph, but what I want to show, and I hopefully I can break it down for you, but what I really want to show, it's a great study by Catherine Cost, and it's just showing that, you know, I think one of the things we thought was that some kids would get better and some kids would deteriorate in terms of their mental health. And what you can see from this graph, if you just focus on um, the... Uh, anything blue is when the parents reported it and anything orange or red is when the youth reported it. But the point of this, um, and this is across all the different ages and different mood symptoms and um, hyperactivity, attention, OCD, oftentimes the things that we look at um, most commonly amongst youth in terms of their mental health. What you can see is that for this middle bar, these middle bars are those that were unchanged. So those, these are kids who had pre-existing 
mental health problems. So they were already struggling with their depression or their anxiety pre-pandemic. But what you can see here is actually, these are the um, where people deteriorated. So for many youth, their mental health got worse um, rather than better. And, and this little these little bars here are just who got better. And you can see that that's actually quite a, a low number of people got better. We're also seeing increases in eating disorders. So there, there was a, in England, the number of new referrals for eating disorders increased by 46% during the pandemic. So that's certainly new data and, um, and tells us that it's not just, you know, depression and our anxiety. Um, there, we're, we're seeing problems across a number of different childhood um, mental health problems. And there's also been an increase in emergency department visits. So 28.4% of um, youth uh, who are the age between the ages of five and 11 and 31% of youth between 12 and 17 years are going to the emergency department. And that's an increase from what would have happened pre pandemic. So, you know, we're seeing an influx in the emergency department as well. And when they pool youth and they compare it to what, how they were like, what their complaints obviously were pre pandemic, um, uh, you know, what we're seeing is a lot of youth are going to the, um, when they go to the emergency department or when there's a psychiatric crisis for them, they're actually 53% of them are saying one of the reasons I'm here is because it's because of COVID. It's too much. Um, it's, it's obviously uh, weighing on, on many youth. So I think one of the implications of that is that mental health recovery planning is really urgent. We really need to start planning for accessible and equitable access to uh, mental health. So telemental health resources, resources in the schools, um, trying to actually increase access to interventions for youth is really critical. And making mental health um, accessible to youth in schools is also very important. And um, I think that you know, um, sometimes in the pandemic, we've been really focused on the medical component of that, which is of course fair and, 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 and critical, but I don't think we can wait to start planning around mental health recovery. We actually need to start planning that now because kids are in crisis right now. So um, I hope that that can be built into a lot of, um, you know, uh, governments and, and uh, local, anyone local, um, you know, across the state or across the country, if we can start to make that recovery planning a priority, I think that youth will uh, benefit from that. Some of the strategies around how do we do that? So a frequent touch point for many youth is actually going to see their family physician. So one of the things that can happen is we screen for mental health. So just asking about mental health, using some standardized questionnaires, which is what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends, um, and taking some stepped care models. So that looks like, you know, this is just a case example, but Cassandra presents to her physician's office for a checkup. She says that she's feeling sad a lot of the time. So step one in the model is just to say, here are some coping strategies, try these out, let's get you back into um, building up some coping strategies to try to help you out. So we often call this self-directed therapy, but then it's really important to follow up with Cassandra, see how her mood is doing with that first initial step, which is not very time intensive or resource intensive. But if, if that's not working, then we need to step up the care and give, and give her access to cognitive behavioral therapy or something where she's guided by a therapist um, and to keep following up and to adding more steps to that as needed. So there are several participant uh, precipitants of mental health distress among youth. So, you know, to curb the spread of COVID-19, a lot of things had to be shifted for youth. Many of their daily activities were sort of stripped away from them. Routines were changed because they weren't in school in a, at a, on a regular basis. Um, their schools were closed. Um, there was also a lot of family stress. So not only were children struggling, but parents were struggling as well. So I can just, um, if I talk a little bit about school closures during COVID-19. So this has been a stressor for youth. You know, it's been really exacerbated. Their stress has been exacerbated because they don't have access to the schools. And, um, you know, for nearly half of the youth worldwide, this was the case. Um, and I think that we need to, think really, really think a lot about the importance of keeping schools open as much as possible, because we know that this can be a place for youth where 
80% of youth are actually receiving their, their services around mental health at school. So if, if schools happen to, if schools need to close, we need to continue to make those school-based mental health services available to them virtually. I think that's really critical. Um, and just to remember that schools provide so much more than learning. So, you know, there's lots that happens in school that helps children with their mental health. So they get to do extracurricular activities there. They might get their mental health services there. Um, you know, they can have um, access to different community services within the school, but they also get to do sports and um, creative work and all of these things are really helpful for their mental health and can certainly act as protective factors for them. So I think that as much as possible, um, schools must be the first to open and the last to close when we're doing COVID, um, we're thinking about COVID restrictions and, and COVID planning. So we need to prioritize youth and make sure that they have access to their schools. Um, there was a really interesting study that showed that this isn't only important for all of the things I mentioned and their access to um, resources, but they're also a study that looked at who had more mental health difficulties. And what what is a consistent finding is that when kids have had been in remote schooling, um, they had more mental health difficulties than children who were at doing in person school. So we're actually seeing um, through a variety of different studies that in-person schooling is really a safeguard for many youth. So we really need to try our best to keep schools open. And then in terms of, um, you know, how kids are doing, uh, you know, I mentioned different, you know, keeping schools open. The other thing I'll, I'll just talk briefly about is how is, is the family stress right now. So kids are embedded in not just uh, fa like their households, but as I just mentioned, schools. So there's a lot of layers that can help kids safeguard kids, schools being one of them. If we take care of the family unit, that's another way that we can help youth. So um, I'll just talk briefly about child mental health in, in Alberta, Canada. So um, this is where I live and study and work. And we've been following families for the past uh, 12 years, since 2008. And you can see just every single year we recruited them. And then we followed the kids when they were one, two, three, five, and eight. And now during COVID, we've started to follow them repeatedly. They were about nine and a half when COVID started. And every six months or so, we've been checking in on them. And um, you know, they have been pretty severely impacted, although most kids here have actually schools have remained open for the large part. Um, we've, we've seen there's been a lot of impact on family income, on, on families being able to meet financial needs because of loss of income due to COVID or loss of work. 78% of families are just telling us they're having a really hard time doing that juggle of online school, um, you know, no, you know, there's no childcare, so doing childcare um, and having to manage their own mental health and working from home has been really difficult. So one of the things we looked at is what were some of the predictors of youth mental distress during COVID? And what you can see, ignore, ignore these numbers if you want, but we wanted to look at not just what happened, how they were feeling before COVID. So that's what you can see here in predicting how their depression during COVID. One of the things we did is really look at, of course, how they were doing prior to COVID because we have that data and that's a pretty um, you know, strong predictor. So how kids are doing before usually predicts how they're doing later. That's a well-established study in the literature. But we really wanted to see a, you know, what else was going on for them that also was predicting how they were doing during COVID. So when kids were feeling disconnected from their parents, when they were feeling like they couldn't quite connect with them and um, you know, uh, the peers weren't accessible to them, obviously. So their parents were their primary point of connection. Um, when they felt disconnected, you can see that that weighs as much as how they were feeling before the pandemic. So that was a, a pretty important predictor. Screen time, which a lot of people have talked about, obviously um, too much screen time. Screen time has doubled during the pandemic. That's something we've been able to demonstrate in our data. Um, but when kids are on screen time too much, um, we're seeing that that has a small contribution to their mood. And when they're not sleeping enough, we're also seeing that that's leading to, or that's predicting some um, elements of depression during COVID. So what I think that that tells us if I can kind of go through this case study is oftentimes we just see the behavior in our office. We see, oh, the child's having 
behavioral outbursts. But a lot of what we need to do is sort of peel back the onion a little bit, um, because what's at the core of um, of that is probably um, really complex and multifaceted explanation for why they might be struggling. And I've tried to illustrate that here with the data that we have. So they're frustrated and they're tired. So they're having more behavioral outbursts. And then we have to ask ourselves, but why are they frustrated? Well, when kids aren't sleeping well, they're more likely to show some hyperactivity behavior. So um, that might be related. But then we have to ask, why aren't they sleeping well? Well, they're spending a lot of time on their phone. Their phone's tucked under their bed. They keep getting texts in the middle of the night. It's waking them up. So they're not sleeping well. Why are they on their phone more? Um, it's a pandemic um, and they haven't seen their friends and they're really missing them. And they're, they're a common source of support for them. And then, so they're bored. Why don't they spend time with their family or siblings? Well, they're feeling really disconnected from them. So I think we have to kind of peel back the layers to really try to understand what's going on with kids while also understanding that we have to talk through these various layers with them to get them back on a path where they can feel a little bit better about how they're doing in terms of their mental health. So, you know, an easy suggestion is to, to tell them, like, let's support families by kind of focusing on three R's, routines, resources, and relationships. So routines are things like getting kids um, doing consistent uh, sleep, meals, recreational activities, school screens. So really trying to come up with a model for kids. If you think about a pie, you know, as their as the 24 hour schedule, how does that break down for them in terms of the different things that they need to feel good and be successful? And I think um, establishing those routines for them so that they understand what can make a healthy routine and what's healthy digital habits, what's healthy sleep um, can be really helpful for them. And there was a great study that showed that when routines were implemented and kids were sticking to a more consistent routine during COVID, this is really helping with their mental health. So that's sort of an easy step one, um, if you think of a step model in terms of trying to get kids back to a place where they're feeling a little bit better. Of course, um, you know, from a policies perspective, we need to have financial and structural resources available for families. Um, when families are stressed, uh, financially or psychologically, it's gonna be really difficult for the family unit as a whole. And then just that relationships are so important, whether kids are getting that relationships from their teachers, those social connections from friends, or the social connection from family, we know that that can act as a huge buffering factor for kids in terms of optimizing how they're doing from a well being standpoint. Um, the last thing I just want uh, to focus on is you know, that there's mental distress amongst uh, youth, and we we're talking about precipitants of mental distress. And one of those is family stress. So we've often, there's been, you know, the Atlantic at early in the pandemic had an article that said like, the kids are not okay, which I would agree with, but I would add that the parents are not okay either. And I can speak about this both from a professional and a personal standpoint. It's the, the pandemic has been really hard. You know, we've had to make a lot of transitions. We've had to keep away from our social supports as parents as well. And we studied this, uh, you know, in our cohort to see how our parents doing over time. And what you can see here is when kids were three, five and eight, which was all pre pandemic across the years that are specified here, that we saw that about, you know, 14 to 19% of parents were telling us they had clinically elevated depression and or anxiety. And that's pretty normative across you know, globally. But what you can see when kids were nine and a half and we were a few months into the pandemic is that um, there was a doubling of mental health distress among parents. And this has been relatively sustained over time in subsequent analyses that we've looked at. So we know that when parents aren't doing okay, kids can often struggle as well. So we have to focus on kids, obviously, but I think it's really important to think about the family unit and you know parents and caregivers are the primary context and usually the most proximal influence for kids so we need to think about parents as well as as children um, and if you're a primary care practitioner oftentimes kids are coming in with their parents so i think that while we need to check in with kids we also need to take some time to check in with parents and one of the things we've provided is a really a checklist for how you might support and guide parents. And I'm, I'm more than happy to share the checklist, but I've put it in PowerPoint slide format here. But, you know, step one is really just to ask the question, how are you doing to the parent? Um, and when they tell you they're struggling, really to listen 
say that I understand this is really something a lot of parents are struggling with, validate and empathize. You can also offer some really specific parent strategies. If, if they say, you know, I need a little bit of help, we can focus on telling parents you need to take time to have some self-care as well. What are you doing to kind of create a little space for you to um, take care of yourself during the pandemic? And how are you managing stress? And if parents are saying, I'm not managing well, I'm worried about my own mental health, then you can encourage them to talk to their family physician who would, I hope, um, then provide some strategies for them or some resources for them. And then I think provide some child specific strategies for how we might promote well being in kids, how they can manage their anxiety, you know, what are some ways we can help kids manage anxiety, we can turn off alarming media. Um, we can, we can give kids guidance and strategies about what to expect when they go to school or they go to the grocery store, how do we keep our kids, how are we going to keep our kids safe so we can talk to kids about that by saying, these are the steps we're taking as a family to to be safe. And then, you know, giving some specific strategies if kids are having some behavioral difficulties, um, you know, some more evidence-based techniques um, can also be offered when kids are seem to be really struggling in terms of the behavioral difficulties, you might wanna make a referral to that. So I'm gonna kind of come back to just saying that the last thing, you know, I, I really want us to emphasize and I hope we can have a conversation of and I think Jordan will probably really illustrate for us is that while children haven't been the immediate face of COVID-19 because we haven't been as worried medically about, you know, what happens when kids get COVID, they usually bounce back, they, it's not as significant medically as it has been for adults, um, they really are the face of this, of its future. So they're depending on us to advocate for them and I think it's our collective responsibility to ensure that their mental health is a priority and that it actually um, is a priority as parents, a, a priority at the schools and priority at the policy level because they really need us to be that advocate. So I just want to have say a few acknowledgements to all the funders who obviously help our work. Uh, function and operate. And then uh, to everyone in my lab who um, has done various things and have contributed to the research that I've talked about today. And I'm happy to take questions. And I, I think that'll wait till after Jordan's presentation. But thanks again for having me. And I look forward to the question and answer period. Thank you so much, Sherry. That was terrific. And I, I love the ending point that, um, you know, the the kids are the face of the future of the pandemic. That's really, um, yeah, that was really powerful. And so now we'll turn to Jordan, um, who is a senior in high school from Nevada. And then um, I came across Jordan. She did another event at Harvard Chan. I think it was back in the, was it the spring? Um, I find time a bit of a blur this last year, actually. Um, and so, um, I asked Jordan so that we could get her perspective as actual a actual youth um, on um, her experience with her own mental health and that of her peers during during the pandemic. And um, so, Jordan, why don't you start, and then we, you know, I can ask some questions that we talked about. And Jordan's <laughs> at school right now, so that's yes, sorry, I'm at school. So if you guys hear any bells or anything, I'm so sorry in advance. So um, thank you for having me today. I'm honored to be talking about adolescents' mental health again. Uh, I just recently started uh, school again, um, early August, and I thought that it was gonna be just a good transition back from being online for almost a year and a half to actually going to see people and be with friends and see my teachers for the first time. Uh, sadly, once I got to school, that was not the case. It was really crowded. It was a lot of overwhelming emotions that overcame me, and I did not know how to deal with it. Um, this is due to the fact that I was inside for almost a year and a half. Um, but it wasn't only me that I saw that this was happening too. It was also my friends who were there. Um, many of the teachers were also overwhelmed. Um, I mean, just people that you wouldn't even expect were just cracking down. So the effect of the pandemic did not just also happen inside, but also carried with us when we came back to the school. We are always constantly wondering, are we gonna get shut down this week? Are our clubs gonna get shut down today, tomorrow? You know, we, don't, we do not know when these things are gonna happen. So we're in constant fear 
and anxiety for it that we're just cracking down at this point. Um, I've noticed that also there have been more fights, more violence, more anger towards kids, towards the parents, towards teachers, towards the people that we should be looking up to. And I've just been thinking, why is this happening? Why this has never happened, especially at this school before. And I had to think about it, not from my own selfish persona, but from the minds of other people who are, these are people that are hurting. These are people that haven't been around people for so long, that haven't had real human connection, that may have been living at home and not getting real help. So it takes a lot out of a person to think like that. And I think that many adults should start thinking like that as well, because it's not every day that there's a pandemic, first of all. You know, you don't just wake up one morning and then your life changes forever, especially as a kid. Um, I do agree that um, we are the future. Um, we will always be the future. Um, this, this event will carry us throughout our whole entire lives. We do not know how long this will be here, but we're here. And it's not just the adults that should be fighting for it, it should be the children too, because we have a voice and it should be heard, I believe. And um, mental health and children, especially right now, is really important because they haven't had that opportunity to get it. I know in my school, we have things, we have people who are called social workers who will contact us and take us up to the office and personally talk to us to find out what we can fix. Do you need therapy? Do you not need therapy? Do you just need that extra support in school? But I know a lot of other schools do not have that. And I really think that they should think about including that into their um, school system. Um, also, we need a sense of belonging. After not being in school for a long time, everyone's head just turns off and we're like, well, what am I supposed to be doing? What, and what is my purpose here now? We haven't been here for a year. So what am I really? I can personally say that I left this school as a sophomore and I'm back as a senior. When I came back, I did not know what I was going to do. However, I was more in luck than many others because I did have a plan to go to college and just for after life. But many of these kids are confused. They just skip most of their middle school life to come to college, to high school, sorry. And then most of these high schoolers skipped their, the rest of the high school to go to senior year or they're already in college and they do not know what they wanna do. And that help comes from the school. But that doesn't mean that we're all lost causes. And I think that that needs to be recognize throughout the school that we are not lost causes. We just need help. We need to be told that we're important, that we're loved. And if we hear that more often, then maybe kids would want to go to school. Maybe kids would want to succeed because you'd never know what's going on at home. Like I said, we did not plan a pandemic. No one knew that there was going to be a pandemic. So why can't we just actually accept that some people had it way worse than others, you know? And uh, I think that that's the main factor. Um, it's just, we need more recognition in mental health. It's, and I like, I say this all the time because I personally have depression and anxiety. Um, it's gonna get better. I mean, it's gonna get better eventually, but it's gonna get worse before it gets better because you have to face it. And I know children um, don't like to admit that they're going through troubles because they are embarrassed. Well, they say that they're embarrassed, but it's really the social standards that tell them that it's embarrassing when it's not. If there was a sick kid with a cold or something like that, would you give him antibiotics? Or would you just say, hey, you'll get fine. You're fine. You're perfectly fine. No, you would treat them with antibiotics. So why don't you treat someone that has depression, ADHD, anxiety, with those same types of structures? 
Well, that's because of social structures, especially in the schools. And it needs to be taken down. This whole entire system of mental illness is witchcraft and everything, because you still hear that to this day, is baloney, in my opinion. Um, not in my opinion. It's just, it is. It's just wrong. It's people are people. People have emotions. And you cannot treat someone differently because of those, these emotions. So I believe that schools should start um, making it more normalized that this happens. And this will continue to happen if we do not stop it. Um, also, children, um, anyone um, ranging from even four to 18, we need to know that it's okay to not be okay. And I know that there's always a saying that it's not okay to be okay, but I really mean that because I went through something really bad this year. Um, I did not know if I was gonna make it out, but I stepped out and I said, no, it's fine. It's fine because there's other people in the world who are going through the same exact thing as me, who are going through the same exact troubles as me and we're gonna make it out together. It's not gonna end terrible. You're always gonna be with someone. You can go to a friend, you can go to a family member, you can go to just a random stranger because your life matters. And that's what children need to know. What, Jordan, what would you, thank you so much. What would you, I was thinking about the end of Sherry's talk and um, what do you, what would you recommend if there's, if there's people, especially your age who are watching this or hear this, um, what would you recommend that they like say to their parents or who they go to, um, or what do you think parents or those of us like, in, you know, in the field or wherever, you know, teaching, um, what are we missing? Like what, what's the connection that's missing? Um, I believe that the connection that is missing is miscommunication, like strongly. Um, Parents get a different thing, like they hear a different tone than what we're presenting. Um, I know personally, before my mom truly understood what I was going through, I was very, not like overprotective of myself, but when they approached me in like a confronting tone, I would get defensive and I would start yelling. And it was really just big miscommunication because that meant that I was anxious. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I was just scared. But my mom thought about it as disrespect. But when you talk it out and you really just learn like, oh, this is how she is, you know, we can work on that to not be like that and to not make her defensive. But this is how she is right now. And we can work towards a goal to get there. And I know some people do not have parents that are supported like that because thank God my mom was there, you know, but it can also be an adult at school. Um, they also miscommunicate things. They think of, let's say, a kid that always gets into fights or bully other kids, you know, bullying is not acceptable. I do not tolerate it at all, but you also have to see it in the views of why is this kid bullying this other kid? Well, their at home life may not be as good. They might be getting bullied by their parents or worse. And it's like, you kind of have to step out of that role as a teacher, but even if you have like a dog or a cat, but like that parent role, you know, like someone that you care for and like love and help them out and see what they're going through. It's and like um, um, Sherry was saying about peeling back, I think you just said peeling back the onion or what's going on under the behavior. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing exactly. Like, yeah. and I have a 14 year old son. So I've had that exact situation where just trying to communicate distress or upset and it feels like confrontation to me or disrespect. And you can kind of get sidelined into that, you know, that yeah. conversation and miss the whole picture. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, we have some questions, but I don't know. If, Sherry, do you have anything you'd like to ask Jordan or anything? I we didn't. I didn't prep. I didn't say that in the beginning, but I saw you nodding. So um, yeah. Well, I can thank Jordan for you know sharing her knowledge and experience with us and being so candid, which was so appreciated. It provides such important context um, to the data that we just talked about. Um, 
I guess it, one of the things I wanted to ask is just if you can reflect about like how your friends are doing, like, do you feel like there's, do you feel like this is a collective experience where people are really struggling with their mental health, which is what the data is saying, but what's your sort of experience amongst your collective group? So recently I have noticed that within my group, it has been a shift, like a real big major shift. And that could also be because I'm a senior in high school and I'm learning well, are these the people that I want in my life? Are these the people that I want to carry on with me? But it's also because we have not been together in a long time. Um, I actually went back to school, like officially, I guess you could say, during June for summer school. And I met these people. And it, there was less people at summer school. We thought it was gonna be like that until the first day came and it was so crowded. No one knew where they were going. Um, it was very overwhelming, but ever since then, it's been just mental health just has been collaborating, especially with due to work. Some people have to get jobs. I know some of my friends have to go get jobs to support their family, or they need to get scholarships from this um, sport to get um, into a college because they can't afford to go. Or personally for me, I have to balance all my clubs and everything so that I can even be looked at for college. So it's been a lot of um, back and forth between us, a lot of arguments and everything. Doesn't mean that we don't love each other. It's just the stress of the pandemic, the stress of school on top of that, and then the stress at home life or relationships and everything, that is getting in the way and it's making us like bond, like mm -mm, we just clash a lot. And it's not like us, you know, um, I see this with other um, groups too as well, they have been clashing together because they do not know what we're doing yet. It's been um, at least seven weeks into the school year and the teachers expect us to already, you know, we're in this, we've been in here for seven weeks now. You guys should understand what you're doing, but we don't, we're kids. <laughs> we're never gonna truly understand what we're doing until we're about around my age, you know, getting ready to go into college. But even then, you don't know what you want to do. And I think that's a huge, um, just a huge spot in my group right now and many other groups that I have seen. And I'll just say, Jordan, that many, you know, your guys aren't alone in feeling that you're struggling with some stuff academically. And some of the data coming out is, is actually kids who did online learning versus in-person learning were actually seeing that they're behind in terms of their math scores and their reading scores. So, um, you know, it's expected that there's gonna be some catch up, especially if you've been doing some online learning. So I'm glad you brought that up so that I could just point to the data for a second to say that's actually a common experience for many youth. If they've been online, they're doing a lot of catch up right now. That brings uh, another question. One of the questions that came up is, um, what about substance use during and among adolescents during the pandemic? What happened? I haven't tracked that so much. What happened with that? Maybe Sherry, if you know anything, and then I don't know if Jordan was uh, what you've observed and peers and things. Yeah, it's a great question that I actually don't study substance abuse, but the only data that I've seen so far is that at least in Canada, the visits to the emergency department or admissions are up, and one of the one of the admissions, um, like sources of admission is actually um, increase in addictions and substance use. So we're seeing that reflected in the pediatric hospitals where there's been an influx of admissions for substance use um, amongst other things. But I'm not as familiar with the data. So I'd have to turn to Jordan or, um, you know, someone who has more familiarity with the substance yeah, use literature. Yeah, not an area that I'm an expert in either. I don't know, Jordan, have you observed anything in terms of the use of alcohol, drugs, and things? And, and I mean, the changes of that? I know in adults, there's definitely been an increase. I've seen data on that, at least of alcohol. And uh, within school, there's always problems with that right. pre-pandemic too. Um, you know, some kids are just kids that like to do that stuff, but um. I wouldn't deny that that's happening. And the reason why I say that is because we do not know who um, 
has lived with someone, especially during this pandemic, that either adapted to substance abuse or um, lived in it their whole entire lives. So sadly, I cannot deny that that's not happening because of the statistics behind it. Um, I really wish that it wasn't a thing at all where kids wouldn't have to look to those types of things. Um, but yeah, uh, it's probably happening a lot around school um, or at home because kids are great at hiding things. So you never know, um, but yeah. I think the other thing is a lot of substance use prevention programs that would be offered to youth often happen in the school, you know, where you might have assemblies and, and, and they bring in a speaker to talk about it or it's integrated into some of the, um, you know, well, in terms of well being components in different classes. And so without that available to youth more regularly, it's possible that some of those prevention approaches might have done some preventing, um, but if they're not accessible to youth, um, we might see that one of the consequences of that is an increase in substance use. One of the um, questions that came in the Q&A was, um, Sherry was, um, how long would you, when you were talking about the step care, how long would you recommend between step one and step two, as I said in the Cassandra slide? So I think that was between um, the, the, the pediatrician sort of discussing like coping strategies to like more formal treatment. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a good yeah, great question. So I think that you, you'd want to give a few weeks to a month just to see if any if we can see any change um, in terms of here's some strategies. I often say, think about giving kids a tool belt and you basically want to give them a few st coping strategies tool belt. You want to give them a few tools that they can draw on. So, you know, one might be getting them back into routines where they're sleeping better keeping phones away, but then some more direct coping strategies like, um, you know, teaching them about uh, relaxation skills or some cognitive coping around talking through, you know, when you might have negative thoughts and, and the impact that that can have on how we feel and how we behave. So some kind of straightforward solutions so that at different moments in time, they might be able to draw different tools from that tool belt. But, and, you know, give them about a month to try that out. And if that's not working, they might need that more directive therapy with a therapist. I think too, what, by following up with them, which is a really critical component of that stepped model is you can see if there's been any further deterioration. Oftentimes when we um, look at depression and anxiety, we ask about the last two weeks. So that's something to consider when you wanna see them again, is you wanna give them that at least a two week period where you can see how they were doing in the two weeks prior to when they were seeing you. That's, that's helpful. Yeah, that's help, really helpful guidance. One of the things I struck, because a question I often get is, when is um, something um, more just sort of distress related to situation that you need that these sort of coping or stress management strategies will work versus when is it more mental health treatment? So I think that, you know, kind of gets really well at that. Um, um, question for Jordan was, um, one of the, somebody asked, can you tell us the difficulty of being able to focus in the new classroom setting, being able to focus on school virtually? So has, if you noticed that, I guess they're asking about, um, um, you know, currently in school, I don't know if your situation is you're like all the students are in person and the teachers in person and it's all in person. And how is that in terms of focusing on the, you know, learning versus online for you or, and also maybe what you've observed, because I know it's individ somewhat individual. Well, personally for me, I did better online, um, mostly because I am a, more of an introvert than an extrovert. Even though I'm involved in a lot of things, I prefer to be more alone. Um, so when I came back, um, I realized that that wasn't my learning style, even though I've been doing it for so many years, it was just like a routine. <laughs> so, um, it takes a like it takes how many days I forgot how many days it takes you to like get used to a routine but I got used to that routine and once I transferred back to the classroom I was like wait this is so weird um my teacher is actually talking to me and her computer isn't freezing because she's in person um I got kids over here that I saw their names online but I didn't know that they looked like that or that they talk like that or you know um it's been really a really big adjustment and I think it 
also depends on the person and how they do. Um, but if it was more to socializing point, it was more of like a shock that, oh my gosh, I'm speaking to people. This is weird. I feel awkward talking to people because I have not spoken to someone in like, like in a real tone, like as a child. Like, I don't remember being that sophomore I was two years ago. And it's so weird because I've seen people from two years ago and they're like, wow, you have matured and you have grown. And I'm like, well, how? <laughs> like, you know, I've been inside a house. Um, but it it just depends on the person. And um, I believe during online school, many people have discovered, oh, wow, um, I like online school or wow, online school does not work for me. I have to be in person. So, um, but for me, it was like a completely different um, structure of school. Um, actually, I've been trying to balance that and try to redirect my mind to working with people again and not by myself. And um, it's been a challenge, but I'm finally getting to the routine again, but I prefer virtual. <laughs> I much more prefer virtual. I can only imagine, I was thinking that um, at Harvard, we uh, went back into the pretty virtual until this, until September. Now classes are mostly in person. I mean, I think classes are in person, people are teaching in person. There's some variation. And I have found it a big adjustment. And I, I mean, this is sort of what I study. And I realize there's so much preparation and understandably for testing and COVID symptom checks and all that, but not really, you know, a lot of institutional thought around sort of mental health adjustment and what a big adjustment it would be. And I, it even took me by surprise how kind of, um, there's a lot of positives, but how, and I can imagine, so like I'm thinking about you as a student, students going back to a crowded high school. That is such an extreme, from being at home for a year and a half, that's such an extreme change, you know, how that must be really challenging. I so said one thing, I mean, so Sherry have, um, since you work and make a lot of policy recommendations and things, how, how do you think, um, I don't know, schools and places have, you know, have there been good examples of places that have sort of managed the mental health aspects of the transition back? Or um, I don't know, do you have thoughts, thoughts on that? Um, oh, I think that's a great, <laughs> it's a great question. It yeah. Talking, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great question. I think that one of the recommendations we've made is just ensure that the mental health resources are accessible. So even if you move to online format, because up to 80% of kids get their mental health resources or, or therapy from the school, don't shut down that service just because you move online. So let's keep that service open so that that, you know, so that's accessible to those who need it. That includes like, you know, if you do a substance use prevention program or speaker, you know, you want to make sure that you continue to use those those um, services and, and make those resources available for youth, because the reality is most youth get that information from the school. And I, I appreciate so much what Jordan said about, you know, the, uh, liking it from home a little bit more. And, and I do think there are kind of individual differences on that and some kids might want to be at school more whereas some people found they could concentrate a little bit more at home because it was quieter um and you know i know someone mentioned in the chat like there's there's so many reasons kids go to school and i, I mentioned a few of them and another big one is is that a lot of kids actually get some of their nutritional value from going to school because they get um, lunches and and meals there and that can be really important especially for families who might be low income so I think school offers like a lot of benefits that um, from sports to extracurriculars to mental health services to some you know um, certainly to some food from food and nutrition um, but it, it introduces chaos, a little bit of chaos. There's a lot of people in the room, there's 30 people. So I think as much as possible, um, you know, if teachers can pay a little bit of attention to that and actually kind of normalize and validate for youth that like this can feel weird, this can feel a little bit chaotic and, and find ways so that um, kids can function in, in that new chaotic environment and continue to benefit from being in school. Now that's, that is, that is a um, great point. One of the um, positive transitions I've seen in Massachusetts is 
the um, executive order where insurance had to cover online mental health services equivalent to other services, um, which actually was really challenging before. There, it was very hard to get insurance coverage to do online therapy or even just phone, talk to your mm-hmm. therapist on the phone. And now that's covered, at least for people who have health insurance, like they in things like that. And um, that a lot of that seems to have worked really well. I mean, at least anecdotally, um, colleagues who have practices with especially adolescents and parents, when we take away all that driving and logistics, people <laughs> show up more. And um, you know, and, and a lot of some and some mental health can services can be provided virtually. So that's been a positive, and I hope continues. Um, um, so I can't believe we have, I mean, there's more questions and we're running out of time. So I guess, um, I guess any sort of last words, um, maybe start with Sherry and then Jordan, you'd like to say about this or um, thoughts you'd want to share for parents or kids or all of us struggling, <laughs> parents have kids struggling through this. Yeah, I think I would just um, repeat what some of the things I mentioned in the presentation that We can't wait to implement strategies around mental health for youth. They're in crisis right now. So we can't wait for the pandemic to end or, you know, who knows what wave we're we're going into next. Um, We can't wait for the waves to end in order to actually start to create policies and and practice strategies to help youth. They need that now. They're in crisis now. I think Jordan did a really wonderful job kind of telling us really honestly what's going on for herself and for those around her. Um, and then that, you know, that remember that even though the kids we've said, like, they're not impacted by COVID, that may be true medically to some extent, they are impacted medically to a, often to a lesser extent, um, in terms of their symptoms, but they have been enormously impacted by the disruptions of the pandemic, the restrictions. And I think we need to make sure that we prioritize them because they are the face of our future and, um, they need us to advocate for them. Thank you, that's beautiful. Jordan, is there anything you'd like to close with? We so appreciate, thank you so much for taking time out of your school day (laughs) to join (laughs) us early in the morning. Um, I believe that this is important. Um, I've been trying to advocate for my school to add a um, Zen room, which is a room where there's help for um, mental health. Um, I'm trying to get that implemented um, yeah. for uh, the next school year. Um, even though I'm not here, I want the following generations to have this because I wish that it was there for me. But um, the last few things that I would like to say is that for anyone that really needs help, um, you're not alone. You should always try to find another route um, or take just take the time out of your day to focus on you. It just does not have to be about the people around you or the people that you work for, sometimes you just need to focus on you, just like if you had a cold. Like that's literally the best advice I can give you. Um, I've been learning more about self-care and taking breaks some days. Um, I just took my first official self-care break like last week because I was mentally not there at school. But I realized after that, that I felt more stronger and you need to take breaks on yourself. And to all the teachers, to all the parents, to the siblings, friends of people that have mental health issues or you personally, you're not alone, help them out. Um, Try to reach out to them. Don't approach them like they're anyone different because they're the same person. They will always be the same person. They're just going through a tough time or have been going through tough times. So that's how I'll leave it off. Thank you so much, Jordan, and thank you so much, Sherry. And I love this, the um, Zen room, so I hope you're successful in getting your school to implement that. We should have one at, at Harvard, so <laughs> I'm going to take that idea. But thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And um, to people who asked in the chat, um, we will post the video and we'll send everything around um, to the listserv, and so you'll be able to access it all online. Usually takes us, sometimes it takes us a couple of days to do that. But thank you. Thank you both so much. And um, And nice to see you again, Sherry and Jordan. Have a great day at school. (laughs) Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.